All right, so uh, today you can see on the agenda we're going to be diving headfirst into uniform circular motion. We've kind of been straddling the line between regular study of forces and kinematics and circular motion as we got into gravitation uh, and sort of crossing over from unit two to unit three for the last couple of weeks. But now we're going full into the second half of unit three where it is specifically focusing on uniform circular motion. We'll still look at it as kinematics, how things move and what their velocities, accelerations will be. And we'll still look at it as dynamics. What are the forces causing it? Um, and so it's going to have a kind of a similar feel the first semester, but instead of taking a whole semester to get those foundations laid, now that you have the foundation, it's just, okay, well, how does this apply to the new scenario? All right, so I've got a couple of demos and videos that we're going to look at throughout the lesson today. Um, but before we jump into that, just a reminder that the AP classroom assignment is due tonight, so make sure you've watched those videos. Um, again, make sure you watch the video all the way to the end, otherwise it'll tell me that you haven't completed it. So um, just let it run to the end, even you know when it gets to that part where they're saying, and eh, next time or whatever, just it's only a few seconds, let it go so that it'll actually mark you as have completed it. Um, and then on the multiple choice questions, their division of what's in the questions and what's in the videos isn't perfect. There's a little bit of uh, in some one section of questions that kind of is what we're going to cover in class today. So if you haven't answered the questions yet, you'll not, not even notice probably because we're going to cover it in class today. But if you've already finished it, there are probably a couple of questions you're like, that wasn't in the video. Uh, so they just haven't quite perfected that since they're reworking everything this year with the new curriculum design. So there's a few little flaws they're still trying to fix. But again, it's not graded for accuracy. I know it's frustrating to have to try to answer questions that you're not sure about, but they're still trying to iron all those details out. Uh, if you haven't answered those multiple choice questions, then you will be fine after today's lesson, I think, because even though it's not in the video, it's something we're going to talk about in class. All right, so I'm not going to do the ball in a circle. I tried that one, but because the building is sloped, it doesn't work very well, so I'm just going to show you a video about that one. I don't know if you guys even knew that, but this building has like a seven or eight inch fall from that end to that end. So anytime you try to do anything that requires a level surface, it's a little tricky. And so I'll show you a video on that one, but it's also kind of cool because it shows you another one that would be a little bit too dangerous to do in a carpeted classroom. So um, we can do see that. And then I want to show you the flying pig and stopper on a string. Let's start with stopper on a string, actually, because this is what you're going to be doing in lab. And so you'll be building one of these where you'll have a variety of different kinds of stoppers and you'll be using a variety of different sizes of weight hanging on the end of a string. And you'll just pass the string through this plastic tubing. And the tubing is just so you don't get like rope burn on your fingers and stuff. You don't have to feel it directly against your skin. The tubing just kind of protects you. It gives a nice angle the weight's going to hang straight down but the stopper we're going to swing it in a circle and so it's going to kind of go out that way so um, you'll be doing something like this and you can see if i keep it going at a pretty steady speed the weight that's hanging down doesn't rise or fall rise or fall if i start to slow down then you can see the weight begins to fall and if i start to speed up the weight begins to rise okay so there's some forces going on there because if this weight's changing its height, then there must be some tension in that string that's pulling it up, right? That's more along the lines of what we studied before. There's got to be some vertical force not letting this fall due to gravity. But now we're also going to be focusing in not just on that vertical force, but also this circular force that's up here above my head. There's something that's making the stopper travel in a circle. What is that something that's making the travel st uh, stopper travel in a circle? It is called a centripetal force, but what's causing it in this case? Yeah, I'm putting energy into it, but um, what's physical? Because my wrist isn't connected to it in any way directly. So what's what's directly causing the stopper to, to go in a circle instead of a straight line? Tension. Tension in the string. And what creates that tension in the string? The weight. Well, the weight. The weight hanging down here, right? Can we calculate this weight force? Yeah. That's pretty easy. We know the mass in grams. We can look at what it says and multiply by 9.8. And we'll know that weight force. And that weight force should be, now that we've reviewed systems again, should be the same as the tension up here, right? Okay. Yeah. And that tension is what's making the stopper go in a circle. 
All right, so you'll be testing a lot of things and measuring a lot of things. We're going to come back to a conversation about that on Friday for you guys. But I wanted you to start to see it and think about it a little bit um, and start to recognize that for that stopper to go in a circle, there has to be a force. There's something making it go in a circle instead of a straight line. What's Newton's first law tell us? Good, an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an external force. And specifically, if we want to really dig into the law, it's that an object stays in uniform constant motion, meaning that it's going in the same direction at the same speed. Or an object maintains its velocity. Velocity being a vector has both a value and a direction. And so it stays with that constant velocity unless there's an external force. What do forces cause? Acceleration. Acceleration. What is acceleration? Change in velocity. A change in velocity. Okay, so if we want to change the velocity, either its magnitude or its direction, then we need a force. Because a change in the magnitude or direction of a velocity is an acceleration. Okay, so with the stopper, if I can keep it going at a constant speed, what's the only thing changing about its velocity? Direction. The direction and how often is that direction changing for the stopper constantly. constantly it's never going in the same direction at any given point right as it makes its path around the circle it's constantly changing its direction as it makes its path around the circle and so if it's constantly changing direction its velocity is constantly changing if that's true what's true about the acceleration it's uniform it's uniform okay all right, so we'll get into more of the math and the functions behind that again. Some of you saw this running a little bit earlier, but we'll get it going again. Maybe shut it down so you wouldn't have to dodge it and duck under it or whatever to get to your seats. Um, but this is the flying pig. So you've probably, many of you heard the phrase, when pigs fly, meaning never. Uh, so when people say that, they're just saying it's not going to happen. But this pig really does sort of fly. If the string wasn't there, it would fall. So it does need the vertical component of the string to keep it from falling. What's the horizontal component of the string providing? Tension. Tension horizontal, right? There's a, it's an angled tension, right? Because the string is at an angle. So there's a vertical part keeping the pig from falling because of gravity. What's the horizontal part doing? What's the horizontal part of that tension doing? Yeah, making it turn. Pulling it back to the center, making it go in a circle. If there wasn't a horizontal component to the tension, it wouldn't go in a circle. There has to be some force or some component of a force pulling it back to the center of the circle. All right. So that is, can be a little mesmerizing, but it's also kind of noisy. So uh, that is, uh, uh, those are a couple of examples of the kinds of things we're going to be thinking about. If something is moving in a circle, there has to be a force. In both cases of the examples that I gave you, it was tension, right? In the pig's case, the part of the tension that was making go in a circle was just the horizontal part, right? In the stopper, it was the tension here, but that would be equal to the tension down below. Because what's true about the tension in a rope? It's, yeah, it's the same throughout. So whatever the tension is down here in that single rope, it has to be the same up here in that same rope, right? And so we practiced systems last week kind of as a review because it's a good connection between gravity and uniform circular motion and letting us think about multiple things at a time and recognizing some things to review about tension in a rope because that's a common factor, uh, but also other elements. All right, so as we... Get into uniform circular motion. We're going to take some notes today on the ideas behind it. And we're going to start just like we did with linear motion with the kinematics part. Kinematics, the breakdown of that word, etymology, the K-I-N-E part means motion. So like kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And then matics means to measure. So kinematics means to measure motion. And we learned a lot of ways to measure and calculate motion with our kinematics equations. Now we're going to say, well, how do those kinematics equations get used 
if something's moving in a circle instead of a straight line? What adjustments do we need to make when something's not going straight, but instead traveling in a circle? Now, this says UCM. UCM is an abbreviation for Uniform Circular Motion, right? And you'll see that abbreviation in a lot of physics books, a lot of websites, and throughout our notes. It means Uniform Circular Motion. All right, can we get someone to read this slide for us? Yes. Nothing? All right, pretty straightforward. You can see this uh, Ferris wheel where the seats are traveling in a circular path. So there have to be forces causing it to go in a circular path. If the engine just gave um, an impetus or a force to make it move, it would go straight. So there has to be some force that's making it not go straight, and it would be mechanically built into the design of this Ferris wheel. All right, can you someone to read this one for us? All right, hey. One of the main differences between linear and circular motion is that circular motion repeat. So instead of measuring the total time it takes for an object to get from point A to point B, we can measure the time it takes to go around a circle once. All right, so the line down below is just reminding us we've really focused in on this most of the year, like things just moving straight. But now we're looking at this. And so it doesn't make as much sense to just say, what's the total time? Because in the total time, it might have made one revolution, it might have made two revolutions, it might have made 13.7 revolutions. It makes a little more sense to focus in on how much time does it take just to make one. Now, for those of you that have studied sine waves and things like that, that kind of math in your math classes, there's a word that we use to describe the time it takes to make one full cycle. Anybody remember that word from math class? Period, All right? We're gonna use that same terminology. It's gonna come up on a slide here in a couple minutes. So we're talking about the period, the time it takes for one full cycle, the time it takes for one full revolution. And because the pattern repeats, that thing just keeps going around the same circle over and over and over again, right? So, um, and the stopper keeps going around the circle over and over and over again. The moon keeps revolving around the earth over and over and over again. That rep repetitive motion, it, the reason we use the word period is when we have repetitive motion, we could say that the pattern repeats periodically, right? So periodic motion um, or repetitive motion is why we choose the word for period. All right, so here you see at the top, the actual title, Uniform Circular Motion. That's the UCM you saw in the previous uh, title slide. There are a couple things about uniform circular motion. We call it uniform because we're going to limit ourselves, just like we limited ourselves with various things in first semester for linear movement, we're still going to limit ourselves with circular. We're going to say that it's going to always be uniform, meaning that the radius will stay the same for any given scenario. And we'll also say that the speed of the object, how fast it's moving around that circular path, will stay the same. And notice we're saying speed here because speed is just the magnitude of velocity in this case. When we think about the velocity of the object traveling in a circle, its linear velocity would always be tangent to the circle. It's trying to go in a straight line tangent to the circle, but there's some force like a string or something that pulls it back to the center. Now, when you do your experiment with the stopper, you won't keep the radius constant for every trial. Sometimes you're going to have a small radius. Sometimes you're going to have a larger radius. But for any given trial or any given scenario, we're going to keep it constant for each measurement. Same with speed. You're going to try to keep the stopper going at a constant speed for each trial. So sometimes if the radius is changed, you might have to spin the stopper faster or slower. Or, or slower. If the weight hanging down below changes, you might have to spin it faster or slower. But for each trial, you're going to try to keep it constant. Okay, so 
you'll be deciding, okay, if I put more mass hanging down here, do I need to keep it going faster or slower if the radius is constant? Or if, I need, if I'm gonna change the radius and I keep the mass the same, what's the speed gonna do? And how, what will the constant speed be? So we'll be manipulating these measurements, but we'll only manipulate them one at a time, the fair test principle for experiments. And for each trial, we'll keep the radius constant within that trial. It will be different from a prior trial perhaps, but it'll be constant within that trial. So will the speed. And so we'll keep it to be uniform in each trial that you take data for. Yeah, Don. How do we keep it constant for the ones that have to spin? Yeah, it's, it won't be perfect. And so this is one where your data always gives you good trends, but it's not gonna be quite as nice. The last lab we did was, you know, we got a class average of, uh, or actually all four classes together, a class average of 9.837, which is pretty darn close to G, right? And there weren't very many groups that were far off at all. That's one of those labs that almost always works really smoothly. This one, we'll have some groups that get really good data, other groups, not great, but at least you'll be able to see some trends, okay? Um, because it is hard to keep it constant. But and one thing that can help, and I'll we'll talk more about this later. We get into the uh, nuts and bolts of the experiment. But one thing that can help is to put tape on the string. So if I put tape on the string at a certain length here, and then start spinning it to make sure I don't hit anybody or anything from hanging from the ceiling. If I keep that tape at a certain height here, then I know I'm keeping the radius the same. And as long as the radius, I mean, if I slow down, it's going to start to fall. And if I speed up, it's going to start to rise. And so if I mark this tape or clip, a paper clip or something on this string, if I keep that at the same height, it's going to keep me rotating it at about the same speed. So it won't be perfect, but it'll be close. And you might come up with some other methods, that's the most common method students use is just measuring on the string where it is to try to keep it steady. And some students are really good at it. Like some students will spin it and they'll be able to keep it steady and other students won't. And they'll be hitting themselves in the head and there'll be all kinds of issues. And so in your group, you'll figure out, okay, who is the best at this particular skill? And so you'll probably have them do most of that portion of it while the rest of you are making measurements and counting repetitions and things like that. Um, you can do it however you want, you know, everyone could do a different trial, uh, but generally what I see is some students in each group always do it pretty smoothly and get the data pretty quickly and other students just for whatever reason struggle to keep it steady. And so um, maybe you'll have a group where everybody's good at it, but uh, you'll, you'll just have to figure that out within your group when we do that. We might be able to start it Friday. Um, based on the class yesterday, we didn't get as far as I had hoped, so guessing we'll end up doing the lab next week instead of Friday, but I know we won't be able to finish it Friday, but I'm hoping we might be able to start it Friday. We'll see. All right, so we've mentioned this before. Uh, I asked you this question, and you knew the answer before. When something is in uniform circular motion, the direction of the velocity is always changing. It's constantly changing. But if it is uniform, then like we said on the previous slide, we want it to have a constant radius, and we want it to be moving at a constant speed. So kind of just a summary of the previous slide, but now emphasizing the fact that it is true that even though the radius is constant and the speed of the object is constant in magnitude, or the magnitude of the velocity as speed, the direction of the velocity will be constantly changing, which means the velocity is constantly changing, which means there has to be an acceleration. And that's the train of thought that I hope you're starting to be able to think through as you read a question, as you think through a new scenario. Is there a change in velocity in any way? In its magnitude, which we often call speed, in its direction, is it changing in any way? If it is, then you should be thinking, okay, there has to be an acceleration. If there is an acceleration, there has to be what? Force. A net force, right? If there is a net force, then you can start drawing free body diagrams and figure out how the forces don't balance. Where don't they balance? What's, why is there a net force? And so that's gonna be 
sort of the mentality the rest of this semester is using all that foundation you laid last semester and thinking that process through to a bunch of new scenarios. And for this week and next week, it'll be on things moving in a circle. All right, now if you have already answered those questions on um, AP Classroom, you saw this term centripetal. Some books and sometimes within this uh, document, they refer to it as radial. But I'll use the term centripetal because that's College Board's term of choice. And centripetal literally means center seeking. If we break down that word centripetal to its roots, it is center seeking. So this acceleration that we're witnessing here with an object traveling in a circle is directed to the center of the circle. And you may have heard the term centrifugal. Sounds similar. Centrifugal or centrifugal force. Centrifugal force doesn't exist. Right? People use it to describe what they feel. So for instance, you're driving in or you're riding in a car. You're not really paying attention. You're not ready for it. The driver has to swerve. Car turns this way and you fly that way, right? Now, did you really fly that way? No, you just tried to keep going straight and the car was turning out from under you, okay? You keep going straight because of Newton's first law. An object with a constant velocity continues to move with that same velocity unless there's an outward force, right? So your body has inertia. Your body wants to go straight. So what we call a centrifugal force really isn't a force. It's a property of all objects, that all objects have inertia based on their mass. All objects want to follow Newton's first law. And the only time they don't follow Newton's first law is when you apply an outward force, which still follows the law, but that's the exception that's built into the law. Okay. Is there a difference between like the center seeking force when it's tension or when it's normal force, like from a track or something? Um, we're going to talk about all kinds of examples, and the way we treat it in all those cases is the same. Are they all called centripetal? They are all called centripetal. Yeah. And the tricky thing about this one is kind of what you hinted at here. Centripetal force can be caused by a lot of different things. And so that's sort of the um, part of recognizing how to solve a problem is, well, what's causing it? Is it a string? Is it gravity? Is it a normal force? What is it? Yeah. And that's what you have to figure out in the problems you're solving is what is causing the centripetal force. Yeah. Yeah. But you'll solve it mathematically and use the terminology the same regardless. Yeah. All right, so these next few slides, I would encourage you, you can write down obviously as much as you want. I'm not gonna tell you you can't write anything, but I would just encourage you to not worry too much about the details. You're not going to be asked to derive this relationship, but this is designed to help those of you that have had some pre-calculus to start to connect the dots between some things that you probably have learned or are learning in that class compared to what we're doing here. And it's going to help us derive an equation. Now, the equation that it's going to help us derive is right here in the middle. It says A sub R. Now, College Board gives you this equation but they don't use a sub r, they use a sub c. On one of the earlier slides, we said that normally we call this centripetal acceleration, but some books call it radial acceleration. That's why they're using an r here for radial, but College Board uses c. And when I write it on quizzes and worksheets and stuff, it'll, see, it'll say c, okay? But that's the relationship, and they give it to you. It's right here. And I will say though, as we go through today's notes and really this whole unit and also another unit later this year, there's an awful lot of equations we're going to derive and, and use in class that aren't on here. And so I'll try to highlight them as we go. But if you've been keeping a collection, we've only had two or three so far. But if you've been keeping a collection of those equations that we learned but that aren't on the list, then I would encourage you to really keep track of that. because There's a bunch in this unit that you'll want to know. All right. So this, this one, though, is given. And here's what we're trying to, to illustrate with this scenario. If we look at the change in velocity in the limit that the time interval becomes infinitesimally small, we see that we get two similar triangles. So here is one scenario. The object is moving in a circle counterclockwise. It's at point A at one instant, and a little bit later, it's at point B as it travels along the circle path. At this point, because its velocity is tangent to the circle, 
it's wanting to go the direction of this green arrow. But the string or gravity or whatever is causing that centripetal acceleration makes it follow this curved path. When it gets to position B, now its velocity wants it to go this direction. Its inertia wants it to go this direction, so its tangential velocity would be this direction, tangent to the circle. But the string or whatever this is keeps it curving on beyond that and doesn't allow it to go in that straight path. Now, what they're talking about with the limit of time here, the velocity is, uh, the acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. So if we keep making the time smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, in other words, as this time approaches zero, these two dots A and B get closer and closer and closer together. There's a couple things. Regardless of how close they are together, the closer they are together, the more similar these relationships are. But one thing we can see is that this triangle that is a measure of the radius of the circle and the distance between the two points that we're observing, and a triangle that we could make with these two velocity vectors, and they've drawn it down here. If we take velocity one and velocity two and connect them tail to tail, which we normally don't do, but they're just trying to show you how this creates a triangle. If we create these tail to tail, this is an isosceles triangle because both of these sides are the radius of the circle, which is constant. This is an isosceles triangle because both of these velocities, it has to be uniform speed. So the magnitude of these velocities are constant. It's only the direction that's changing. And so these two triangles are similar and they're being derived from the same information. They're not congruent necessarily because this is based on the radius of the circle and this is based on the velocities, but they are similar. And that, that will help us make some connections. The other thing that I wanna show you or explain, if I look at this left picture over here, is the length, the straight line distance between A and B, is the straight line displacement here more or less or equal to the length of this arc? Equal, less, less. If, if it's going to be less, but as we bring points A and B closer and closer and closer together, do the lengths get more similar or more different? Similar. Similar. More similar. The, cl the closer they are together, the more that arc starts to resemble a straight line, right? So as the time approaches zero, that straight line distance begins to become nearly congruent with the arc length. All right. So there's a couple pre-calc kind of concepts to help you make some connections here. All right. So if displacement is equal to velocity multiplied by time, then this straight line velocity time would be the displacement. Like this displacement, we could calculate it using V times T, the straight line. And if we use a time difference that's approaching zero, that straight line distance or displacement will be virtually equal to the arc length, right? All right, now if we, and that's one triangle, radius on the two sides, displacement on this uh, third side. And over here, we've got these two velocities. We've got the two velocities that are equivalent and then what's change in velocity? Acceleration. acceleration. All right, so we've got velocity and acceleration. Here we got radius and displacement. But those two triangles are similar, not congruent, but similar. All right, if they are similar triangles, we can set up a congruent, not a congruency, but a proportion. All right, the angles would be congruent. And the lengths would be proportional. So we can say that this side, this third side of the blue triangle, compared to this side, which these two are equal, so it doesn't matter which one we pick. The third side compared to the long side, that's one proportion. That has to be proportionally balanced with VT compared to R. Right? So delta V doesn't necessarily equal VT, and V doesn't necessarily equal R, but this ratio has to equal this ratio since they're similar triangles. And so when we use proportional reasoning, we can set up an equivalence based on ratios. So now in this step, all we're doing is doing some cross multiplying here. So we multiply both sides by this V that's in the denominator. So now this becomes V squared. And we divide both sides by T to move this over here. So now we've got change in velocity over time 
equals v squared over radius. Well, change in velocity over time is acceleration. So the acceleration when something is moving in a circle can be calculated using velocity squared divided by the radius. So if we take some proportional reasoning and think through some limits logic, we can come up with this equation for the acceleration of something moving in a circle. This acceleration is what causes it to go in a circle. This is the acceleration that causes it to change its direction. Does this acceleration cause it to change its speed? No, it's only causing it to change its direction, right? Because uniform circular motion means it can't change its speed. So this is only true if the speed is constant. Yes? So what direction is this pointing at? Yeah, we're going to get to that here in just a second. Yeah, Chris? Any direction? Yeah. So any questions about, I mean, like I said, you're not going to have to derive this relationship, but are there any questions you want to ask about thinking that through? And then we're going to almost immediately answer this next question that Aiden just asked about the direction. Okay. Uh, one other comment then that I'll say is, because this is just how something changes direction in uniform circular motion, it is not the same as the acceleration we used before. Now we have two kinds of acceleration. We have linear acceleration, and now we have centripetal acceleration, and they're measuring something different. We can't use linear acceleration to figure out this concept of how something's changing direction in circular motion. And we can't use this acceleration to find out how, so, how something's changing speed in a linear manner. There are two specific types of acceleration. And later this year, we're actually going to learn a third. So before this year's over, you'll know three different kinds of acceleration that evaluate velocity changes for different scenarios. But it's still acceleration, it's just a different kind. Okay. Questions before we move on? All right. So here's the answer to Aiden's question. If we recreate this velocity, velocity, delta velocity triangle, we've looked at that a couple times now. If we recreate it on the circle itself, you can see that that change in velocity or acceleration will always point to the center of the circle. So this centripetal acceleration is called center seeking, centripetal, because it always points to the center of the circle. As the object moves around the circle, that triangle keeps shifting so that the third side always points to the middle. Since those two velocities have to be equal because it's uniform circular motion, that third side will always point to the center of the circle. All right. Hence again, the name centripetal, center seeking. So, Here's my next question for you. If this centripetal acceleration, this new brand of, of acceleration, if it's always to the center, what would be true about the force causing it? It will also be constant because the acceleration is not, is not changing, it, unless like we change the mass in different tests of an experiment or something. It'll be constant and it will always point to the center of the circle, all right? Okay, so wrapping it up, here's our conclusion. This acceleration we've just kind of discussed, defined, and derived an equation for, we call centripetal or center-seeking acceleration. It will always be directed to the center of the circle, and we can find its magnitude by taking the velocity squared, which will be constant because it's uniform circular motion, divided by the radius, which will be constant because it's uniform circular motion. All right, now again, this equation is on here. And hopefully you're, you have a copy of this somewhere that you keep handy because this is gonna become more and more important as we learn more and more equations. We now have our kinematics equations up here at the top. Then we've got Newton's second law. Now we've got friction. And then right underneath that, now we have centripetal acceleration. We also have the spring force down here. There's a bunch of geometry things over here that you might want to refer to. We're going to look at one of them later today. On the backs, all the metric prefixes over here. 
some uh, trig stuff right here, some units to remind you of what the units are and some constants. So we're, we're picking up more and more pieces of this at kind of a, an exponential growth scale, right? Like we've slowly built up a few and now we're rapidly adding more and more to it the last in this unit. Okay, so go ahead and uh, grab a small whiteboard and a marker and something to wipe the marker with, a racer, a rag. Um, there's markers in the pink boxes as well as along the side over here. There's erasers and rags up here by Kenny's desk and also on the back table. If you need to spray down your board because it's nasty, there's also spray back there and spray up here. All right, we're going to go through a, a small set of questions to have you answer, but I'd like to see if we're getting some consistency here. So rather than just asking a few students what you think, I'd like to have you write your answers on the board. Uh, write them big enough so that I can see them, uh, especially those in the back of the room. You know, don't write it tiny in the corner where I can't tell what you wrote. I write it big enough so I can see what you think the answer is, so I can see if we're having some consistency. If we're very split, that means we need to have some conversation. If we're pretty consistent, that means we can keep moving, and it'll just help me kind of informally test whether you're getting it or not okay so here's question number one is it possible for an object moving with a constant speed to accelerate and then explain so each answer says yes or no with an explanation i'll let you read the answers and decide what's the best answer <laughs> all right for a second i have to read <laughs> There's also some back there in those pink boxes. I mean, you're welcome to use that one too. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. I'm going to leave I'm seeing quite a bit of consistency. Um, a little discrepancy for a few, but it is possible. So. It's C or D, and it's C, which most of you picked. Even though the speed is constant, if the direction is changing, that means the velocity is changing, right? Velocity is a vector. And so if the speed is changing, that's acceleration. If the direction is changing, that's the acceleration. It doesn't have to be both. Could be both, but it doesn't have to be both. So as long as the direction is changing, that is an acceleration. Hence, we have centripetal acceleration when it's not changing speed, but is changing direction constantly. All right, consider a particle moving with constant speed such that its acceleration of constant magnitude is always perpendicular to its velocity. Is it A, moving in a straight line, B, moving in a circle, C, moving in a parabola, or D, none of the above is definitely true all the time. Oh no, I definitely know. Yeah, it's in that one. Speed down. Is it like perpendicular to the same? I'm not confident. Think about it. What is the It's just your velocity. All right, so. It's always going to bring it Oh, wait to the right or turns and stuff like that. Yeah, makes it B. So I'm seeing, again, some pretty good consistency here, most of you choosing B. If it's got a constant speed, or you could say the magnitude of the velocity, and it has a constant acceleration and they're perpendicular, that will always be true for something moving in a circle. 
And that will always be true for something moving in a circle. It will have constant speed that is perpendicular to the acceleration. And that's because, if we go back to the picture, the velocity is tangent to the circle, which means it is perpendicular to the line that makes the radius. And the radius line is where the acceleration lies, to the center. Those will always be perpendicular. They're perpendicular here. They're perpendicular there. They're always perpendicular. All right, next question. An object moves in a circular path on a constant or at a constant speed. Compare the direction of the object's velocity and acceleration vectors. So hopefully you can get this one right now. Tempting to choose C just because it's snarky, but or sorry, D because it's oh, snarky. Oh, but, <laughs> But C is correct. <laughs> yeah, C is correct. <laughs> uh, they always are perpendicular. All right, next question. This one's a little trickier. Two cars, let me uh, change this so you can a slight zoom out so you can uh, hopefully get it all on the screen here. Well, do a little less. I should be able to see the question and the answers. All right, so two cars go around the same circular track at the same speed. The first car is closer to the inside of the circle. Which of the following is true about their centripetal acceleration? A, both cars have the same centripetal acceleration or centripetal motion since they both have the same speed. B, the centripetal acceleration of the first car is greater since its radius is smaller. C, the centripetal acceleration of the second car is greater since its radius is larger. D, the centripetal acceleration of the first car is less since its radius is smaller. Think about the equation we derived. All right, someone who chose B, explain your logic here for us. Just like hey, Chris. Uh, as the radius goes down, then the number that the velocity squared is getting divided by is decreasing, meaning that the acceleration is increasing. Good. We look at this equation. The acceleration and the distance are inversely related. So the smaller this R value gets, the bigger the acceleration gets. Okay. And in this case, the first car is closer to the inside of the circle, meaning it's got a smaller r, a smaller radius. All right. Next question. Oh, we're done with the questions for now. All right, so two videos to show you. Uh, so keep the boards. I think you're going to need them again when we get to some slides later down the road. But um, I want to show you two quick videos one that I was hoping to demonstrate that just won't work uh, for a couple reasons, and then the NASA one, which I can't simulate near weightlessness or virtual weightlessness. So. This is a great demonstration for showing that if something's moving in a circle and you remove the centripetal force, it'll move in a straight line. But if you're teaching circular motion, I've got another demonstration that's worth doing first. This is a really simple way to introduce some basic ideas about circular motion. The ball moves in a horizontal plane, which makes it easier to understand the forces involved than with, say, something moving in a vertical circle because we can ignore gravity. When I do this with my students, 
I place an object about there and I ask them to tell me when I should lift the hoop so the ball knocks it down. Right, so as a physics teacher, I knew when to lift the hoop because I knew the ball would go off at a tangent. But that's not obvious to everyone, and this demonstration can really help to clear up misconceptions about things flying off radially when you remove a centripetal force. The ball goes from moving in a circle to moving in a straight line, and we know from Newton's first law that if something is moving in a straight line at a steady speed, the resultant force on it is zero. So what's going on when it's in the hoop? Well, the hoop exerts a contact force on the ball at right angles to its surface, and that force changes the velocity of the ball. The force is always directed towards the centre of the hoop, the centre of the circle. Take away that force and the ball obeys Newton's first law and carries on moving in a straight line. This is true of all objects moving at a steady speed in a circle. The instantaneous velocity is always at a tangent to the circle and the force keeping it moving in a circle is at 90 degrees to this that is, towards the centre of the circle. We describe the resultant force that makes something move in a circle as a centripetal force, and it's important to emphasise to students that this word simply tells us the direction of the force and nothing more. The force may come from a contact force, as in this example, or friction, or gravity, or tension in a string, or any combination of these forces, so it's really important to look carefully at any particular situation to identify the origin of the centripetal force. This is really just a more exciting version of the demonstration with the hoop and the ball. And it's not as dangerous as it looks. If you're going to do this in class, wear some goggles and a lab coat to protect your clothes from any stray sparks. Stand your students a couple of metres back in a plane that's parallel to the plane of rotation. You don't need to hear all the safety directions, but it's fun to see the sparks and notice that they go tangent to the circle when they leave that, on that path. Um, and I didn't want to do this one because we have carpet and we've already caught this carpet on fire once. So it's clearly not fire retardant. Um, not you guys, but another class. Can I ask um, what's that? Can I ask how? Well, we were doing, it was AP Physics 2 and we had lit objects because we were trying to test thermodynamics and one of them fell off the table and oh, caused carpet on fire. Fortunately, I was standing right there and put it out immediately. So uh, like there's one spot you can see, but it instantly flamed up. So they're not fire retardant. Yes. Um, and so I thought that may not be the safest thing to demonstrate here in the carpeted classroom. Uh, and you can see it well. The ball and a hoop, I actually have done that before, but I've got some like pool noodle hoops over there that I made. But in this room, because of the carpet, there's a lot of friction, so it slows down really fast. And secondly, if I orient it this way, when it comes out, it goes like this and starts curving down the slope of the building. And so you can't really see it properly in this setting. Uh, so his video makes it nice and visual. Um, so that you can see it clearly and see what you're supposed to see, not some uh, other uh, um, thing going on. But this one, obviously, I can't do a near weightless scenario, so we'll check out the International Space Station instead. <laughs> and truly, it was there in constant recall. A spinning Ferris wheel, a yo yo trick called Around the World the International Space Station. They've all got at least one thing in common. Find out how they all come full circle next on A moon orbits a planet, just like a planet orbits a star, in a curved, nearly circular path. A Ferris wheel curves around a central point as well. And of course, when you go around the world with a yo-yo, it's circling around your hand. And why does all of this happen? Because of a little thing called centripetal force. Basically, centripetal force is a force that makes an object, like planets or other satellites in space, follow a curved path. The word centripetal means center-seeking. What better place to study centripetal force than on the largest artificial satellite in space, the International Space Station? In addition to actually experiencing centripetal force, the freefall environment on board the ISS allows for some really cool demonstrations. So let's send it up to Expedition 22 astronaut Jeff Williams. This is a tool. It's a special tool that we use on board the space station, actually during spacewalks. Uh, but it's, it's a heavy metal object, and that's what I really wanted to use. And you can see I have it tied to a string, or with a string, onto this bungee right here. And it's just floating here in weightlessness. And you can see the, spr the st string here is uh, rather loose, and it's just kind of floating randomly. 
if I were to rotate this thing on the string around this bungee, and let me do this, you can see that the string pulls taut and stays tight. In fact, if you look really close at the bungee, you can see that the bungee bends at the point that it's rotating, and it bends toward the tool. And that is uh, caused by the centripetal force due to the angular acceleration of the, of the tool as it rotates around, keeping this string tight and keeping the rotation in a circular motion. It's the same kind of force that applies to uh, the rotation of planets around the sun or the moon around the earth. So I want you to notice this equation they're putting on the screen here. We derived this, right? V squared over R. And even though that's a new form of acceleration, if we want to find the centripetal force, we just use Newton's second law, m times a. The mass won't be different, whether it's moving straight or moving in a circle. It's just the acceleration that's different. So we just take mass times this new formula for acceleration when we're finding centripetal force. Now, this equation is not on here. I think they're just assuming that if you know that the A is V squared over R, you would know well enough to multiply it by mass to get the force. So they don't give you that. Probably you could just think that through, but I want to highlight that is an equation that's important. Just multiplying V time, or sorry, uh, M times V squared over R. Or the space station around the Earth. But you might notice that neither the moon nor the ISS is attached to Earth by a string. And they still orbit. Why is that? Well, think about this. Satellites would continue to move in a straight line because of inertia, removing before something forced it to change. Gravity is the force causing that change. Satellites in orbit around Earth are being pulled to gravity is continuously changing the satellite's direction. To understand how this works, take a look at this. I've got a yo-yo and I'm gonna spin it around my finger on this table. The string here is acting like the force of gravity. If I let go when the yo-yo is at this top point, where do you think the yo-yo's inertia is going to take it? Will it continue in a circular motion? As you can see, the yo-yo wants to keep moving in a straight line instead of a curved one. That's inertia. The string is the only thing that held the yo-yo in its circular path. The string simulates gravity. In the same way, the ISS is held in orbit by Earth's gravity. If, for some strange reason, Earth's gravitational pull disappeared, the ISS would continue in whatever direction it was heading. Here's Jeff with another demonstration of centripetal force. Okay, I've got this tea bag, and it's got uh, tea in it, of course, and it's got air bubbles uh, floating around here. The bubbles don't uh, rise to the top in the absence of gravity in this weightless environment of the space station. But if I were to rotate this, and let's see if I can rotate it and keep it in your view of the, of the camera. Let's watch what happens. If you look really close, you'll see the air bubble starting to coalesce in the center of the tea bag. I'm going to try one more time. There's the bubble spread throughout the tea, and if I rotate it, The bubbles coalesce to the center of the T and eventually form a circle. Why do they do that? Because of the centripetal force spread throughout the T. The, the, the liquid T goes to the outside of the bags and it forces the air into the center because the air is, has less mass, uh, less density uh, than, uh, than the liquid. So the air goes to the center. Centripetal forces affect things here on Earth as well as in space. Things like Ferris wheels or the acceleration of a car going around the curve. But what other applications might this force have in space? You've heard a lot of talk, uh, perhaps, uh, in regards to space exploration about uh, artificial gravity. Perhaps you've seen some science fiction movies. For example, Star Trek, uh, the TV show and the movies. Uh, they had gravity on board. They had some kind of a mysterious artificial gravity. Uh, make believe, of course. Uh, but we've talked for years about artificial gravity on board a spacecraft, especially uh, when you're going for a long period of time uh, for, for various reasons. One of the ways you could produce artificial gravity is by having a space station that rotates. Uh, Maybe very big and uh, the, the bigger it is, the slower the rotation would have to be to produce that centripetal force. Jeff said that the bigger the station, the slower it would have to spin to create the centripetal force needed to make that artificial gravity. To find out why, we have to check out the math. Centripetal acceleration is equal to the velocity of the object squared, divided by the radius of the object. Spin is velocity divided by radius. The radius is the distance from the center of the circle to any point on the circle. The spin and size of the radius are actually in inverse proportion. 
On a spinning station, the larger the radius, the smaller the rate of change needed to simulate gravity. Theoretically, you could do that. Theoretically, you take, could take a large station and produce uh, uh, through centripetal force sort of an artificial gravity to keep everything in its place. Uh, but the problem with that is when uh, it's not very practical because when you spin something and we turn our head around, uh, our head, our vestibular system will get a little bit uh, messed up and uh, it's like if you're going around a, a, on a merry-go-round, riding a merry-go-round, then you step off the thing uh, or you spin around until you get dizzy, uh, it'd be the same kind of thing. So I'm not sure artificial gravity in that way is very practical. Wonder who will be the first to produce artificial gravity? But hey, don't just sit there and spin your wheels. Use that math to help solve this challenge. I'll see you next time on Real World. So uh, just to make sure you understand the scenario with the T, that the T really is a scenario where they're creating, by rotating it, artificial gravity. Um, it's not gravity because of the mass, it's gravity because of the motion. And so, the T wants to go in a straight line and the bag keeps pushing it back to the center, but because it's more dense, it gets pulled to the edges. So if you've ever used a centrifuge in biology class or in chemistry class, uh, that's how that centrifuge works. It spins it around, the more dense substances move to the bottom, and the less dense substances move up. And the space station, because they're in free fall, it feels like they're weightless. They're not truly weightless. They're falling towards Earth, but they have sideways motion. So they're constant free fall with sideways motion, so they never hit the Earth. So it feels like they're weightless because of the way they're moving. And so they'd have to create an artificial gravity to make something be held down or pushed out. Uh, well, not really pushed out, but feel like it's being pushed out by its inertia. All right. So now we're going to add a couple more equations and then we'll finish up with some questions. Um, we talked about this word period earlier today, and now we're going to also talk about frequency and rotational velocity and derive some equations for those. So some of these terms you may already know. If you don't know them, I would, add, I would encourage you to put them in your notes. You'll need to be able to understand them. Chances are they're not going to ask you a question to just define it, but they'll use it as if you know what it means. And so if you don't know what it means, you're going to have a hard time interpreting the questions they ask. So one word they're going to assume you understand is the term period. And period is the time it takes to make one full cycle, or the time around the circular path. We use the variable t for period, just like we use t for regular time, but we capitalize it to emphasize that it's specifically related to something moving in a repetitive pattern. It's still measured in seconds, just how many seconds specifically does it take to make one revolution? And there are some equations on the formula sheet for period. There's three different ones. One that relates to a pendulum, which we'll get to later this semester. One that relates to a spring, which we'll get to later. And one that relates to this lesson, but it has a couple things there. So I'll show you that here in a minute. But when you see capital T, that's specifically period in our context the time it takes for one revolution measured in seconds now when you do your experiment as you're spinning the stopper you'll probably be spinning it fast enough that if you just measure one rotation and try to time it with a stopwatch there's going to be probably a fairly significant amount of error because you might start it too soon or too late you might stop it too soon or too late and you're going to have air on both ends of that in a very short time span. So you could have maybe 50% error if you only time one cycle, all right? But often they'll want you to think about period in this regard that if you are given a total time to make any number of revolutions or trips around the circle, you can always find the period just by taking the total time divided by how many revolutions it was. Now this relationship is nowhere to be found on the college board. So if you need this for now to kind of help you understand mathematically what period means, it may be one to jot down where you can re reference it later. So in the experiment, if you spin the stopper around your head 10 times, you'll still have possibly a little bit of error at the beginning and a little bit of error at the end. 
but that will only be on the first and tenth cycle. That means your other nine would be without human error, right? So the more cycles you do, the better you can find the actual timing for one period. You'd be shrinking the percentage error of your human reaction time, all right? So when you do that experiment, you don't want to try to just go one cycle and measure. That's going to be a large percentage error. Maybe go 10 cycles, 20 cycles, something where the more cycles you do, the Minim the more minimized you've made that human reaction time percent. Now, obviously, you can't do a hundred cycles for every trial. You won't get the lab done. But uh, so you have to use practical sense as well. All right. The second term in the list is frequency, and this is how often the cycle repeats itself. And you again, if you've studied sine waves, cosine waves, those functions, you've probably learn this word as well. Just what the term frequency means there, it's the same kind of an idea here. We're just specifically talking about moving in a circle, not just a sine wave. For uniform circular motion, the number of revolutions that an object completes in a given amount of time is what we call frequency. We use the symbol for frequency or the variable lowercase f. Why lowercase? Yeah, capital is force, so we, we don't want to confuse it with that. And then it's actually per seconds. But rather than writing per seconds, and you could do that, you can say per seconds, or you can do seconds to the negative one power. But usually they'll just write it as hertz, which means per seconds. And Hertz is just named, I think his name was George, if I remember right. Like George Hertz, I think, is who they named it after. So the abbreviation they'll typically use is HZ, which stands for Hertz as the unit of frequency. So the variable is lowercase f. The unit is Hertz or per seconds, or seconds to the negative one power. Again, sometimes probably more so with frequency, they'll just tell you what it is. They'll say it's this many hertz, but not always, just like period. Occasionally, instead of giving you the actual value, they'll tell you how many revolutions there were and what the time was. And so instead of taking time divided by revolutions, you just reverse it and take revolutions divided by time. And a common example of this that you've probably all seen before is in most vehicles, there's an RPM gauge that measures how many revolutions the crankshaft makes per minute. And we won't use RPMs as a measure for our class because a minute's too long for most of the experiments that we do. And so we will just be using Hertz as our unit instead of RPMs. We wanna know revolutions per second, not per minute. <clears throat> All right, so what do you notice about these relationships, period, and frequency? Yeah, if we recognize side by side, they're basically just reciprocal of each other. One is time over revolutions, one is revolutions over time. And so because they're reciprocal, we know that if you know the period, you can just take the reciprocal to find the frequency. Or if you know the frequency, you can just take the reciprocal to find the period. Now, this is the relationship they actually do give you. It's on here. It's kind of embedded in a multi, it says T equals two pi over omega, a fancy looking W. And then it says equals one over F. So they do show you this, but they embed something else into it, which we'll get to eventually, but it's not today. So that's right there. They kind of give you that T for period equals one over frequency. But recognizing that they're reciprocal can help you quickly solve problems. Sometimes you really need the period, but they give you frequency, or vice versa. And as long as you know they're reciprocal, it's just a single step to convert one to the other. Any questions about those terms? All right, our final term for this section. Last semester, we learned that velocity or the speed, the value of velocity, the magnitude of velocity, is just distance over time. 
or displacement over time specifically for velocity. But that was uniquely to something moving in a straight line. For something moving in a circle, we will substitute period in for time. So instead of small t, we'll use capital T. And it won't be total time. It will be specifically the time for one cycle. And what do we call the distance it takes to get around one circle? The measure of how big that is is circumference, right? How, how, how far it is to get around the outer edge of the circle is the circumference. So the distance we're going to substitute with circumference. How do we calculate circumference of a circle? 2 pi r. 2 pi r, which is the same as pi times diameter, but 2 pi r is how they list it on here. And it's actually over here in the geometry and trig part. Circle, circumference, 2 pi r. So they do give you that. So let's go ahead and substitute those two things in. Let's substitute circumference in for distance, because that's how far it is around the circle. And let's substitute period for time, because that's how long it takes to cover that circumference. Here's the math behind it. We put circumference in for distance. We put period in for time. And our tangential velocity or our tangential speed for the object traveling in a circle is just the circumference divided by the period. Now, this equation is particularly helpful but they do not give this to you on the formula sheet. Again, I, I think they're assuming you can just derive it yourself on the spot, which some of you probably can. But if not, having this tucked into your brain is really helpful. 2 pi r, the circumference, divided by t, the period, gives you the tangential speed. Only the magnitude, obviously, not the direction, because the direction is constantly changing. But it would at least tell you the magnitude of that tangential velocity, which we usually call tangential speed. So sometimes they will say, what is the tangential speed? Sometimes they will say, what is the magnitude of the tangential velocity? In both cases, they're wanting you to use this relationship. Okay. So here is our final review of this scenario, this kind of, how did we get to this point? Velocity is a vector, so it does have magnitude and direction. This is how we calculate the magnitude. The direction in uniform circular motion is constantly changing, right? So this just tells us the magnitude of that velocity. So that's why we often refer to it as a speed. We do know the direction would always be tangent to the circle at any instant, but over time that's constantly changing, right? So if we're looking at an instant, we know it's tangent to the circle. But if we're looking at it over a period of time, then it's constantly changing in terms of direction. But this would tell us the magnitude. Now, what do we say is true about period and frequency? They're inverse. They're reciprocal, they're inverse. So I could substitute, instead of dividing by period, I could, how could I use frequency? Multiply by frequency, right? And so another version of this, which they also don't give you, but just recognizing that frequency and period are reciprocal, instead of dividing by the period, I could also just multiply by the frequency if that's what they gave me. So circumference times frequency, or circumference divided by period. Let's look at the units here. Two is just a number with no unit. How about pi? A number with no unit. What would radius be measured in? Meters, yeah. And period? Seconds. So velocity in this case is meters per second, right? If it's frequency, two has no unit, pi has no unit, radius is meters. What's frequency? Per second. Hertz, which is per seconds, right? So meters per second. So we get the same result either way. All right, a few questions to wrap it up. So you can answer these on your whiteboards. A ball is swung in a circle. The frequency of the ball is doubled.
By what factor does the period change? Frequency is doubled. What does that do to the period? Yeah, Aiden? All right, cut in half. They're reciprocal, so um, if, one, if one is doubled, the other one is cut to one half. All right, let's go to the next one. A girl whirls a toy at the end of a string around her head, kind of like you'll be doing in the lab, but with a stopper. The string makes one complete revolution every second. She keeps the radius constant, but increases the speed so that the string makes two complete revolutions per second. What happens to the centripetal acceleration? Does it remain the same? Does it double? Does it quadruple? Or is it cut in half? This is a little bit more. You may want to jot some things down. Put your answer on the whiteboard so I can see what you're coming up with. You might have to process this. It's not quite as easy as the previous one. Seeing, I'm seeing some consistency here. It is C. If when it when it says two revolutions per second, what is that? Directly, it's measuring what? That's directly. It's per seconds, so frequency. So she's doubled the frequency, right? If we go to this equation. If she doubles the frequency, yeah. that changes the velocity to make the velocity double. double. But the acceleration, we come back to the acceleration equation. We see that the velocity is squared relative to the acceleration. Okay, so it doubles the velocity and therefore quadruples. The acceleration. All right. All right. So we're going to save that because there's only about five minutes left. We're going to uh, just skip that for Thursday. All right. So go ahead and put the whiteboards back and then grab one of these worksheets over here from the side. The AP Classroom videos and questions are due tonight. Make sure you get those done before 11.59 p.m. tonight, hopefully well before that. Um, and then this worksheet will be due next time we meet on Friday, and it's just a review, pretty simple uh, math using the equations we learned today, but they're new concepts. So thinking it through, I, I, I just feel like you need a little bit of repetition to make sure you're really getting the concrete knowledge down. Um, so make sure you have that ready for Friday. Yeah, Charlie? Will that be on access by chance? Uh, that assignment? Yeah. Uh, I think I did put it on there, yeah. That's right. just a 10-point 
kind of completion. We'll run through it real quick on Friday before we go on to the next thing and prep for the lab. I just thought I'd Yeah. Yeah, sometimes if it's not for a grade, I don't put it on there, but I think I made this one worth 10 points, so I believe it's on there already. All right, so that is all we have for today. Let me go ahead and stop the recording here. Any questions about what we covered today?